So as you can see, thinking about knowledge and minds and our grasp on the world is diverse and involves the interplay between different specialized communities like psych cognitive psychologists, computer scientists, philosophers, and it leads to multiple views of the person, which is really important. Um, the representational view of cognition, the idea that we construct inside something called mind or maybe inside a brain a model of the of something called the external world this account has a huge grip on public imagination at the moment and it is a product largely of the the power of the computer metaphor which hit at the end of the second world war but it's um it's deeply problematic in many respects. It's a useful way of developing technologies. It's sometimes a useful way of looking at our command within a limited uh, sphere. But as a view of what we are, it's um, strongly lacking. So as we speak of knowledge being represented within the mind, that makes sense within a computational view of mind and brain, but there are other views and we need to acknowledge that and be aware that uh, nothing is decided. Um, this is all ongoing work and cognitive science is enormously exciting because this is precisely where we uncover, as it were, some of the weaknesses of the collective imagination. Um, so there's a lot of disagreement and one uh, hallmark of the disagreement is the way in which different communities acknowledge that any act of perception or of action or of doing anything in the world happens in a particular context. And it's very easy to ignore the context in which something happens and to treat it as trivial or unimportant. Um, representational views tend to do this. They tend to assume because they rely on the fiction of um, an internal, a closed internal domain in which cognition is going on, they ignore the fact that cognition actually happens in the world and makes full use of the properties of the world. So let's take something as vaguely defined and full of philosophical dangers as the notion of memory. One way to think of memory is as something internal, as if your entire life were replayed on a videotape at the back of your brain and you just went in and pulled things out. Uh, when I state it like that, that seems a little unlikely, I'm sure. Now, of course, remembering goes on all the time, but remembering always goes on in a specific context. And in the course of a day, you'll remember tons and tons and tons and tons of things. And you'll make use of computers and papers and notes and all kinds of things. You will remember in specific context for specific purposes. The context, in other words, is part of the act of remembering. So that pushes, warns us not to try and stuff everything inside the head and to ignore the world. Strongly representational views run the risk of creating the illusion of what's called the Cartesian theatre. Remember, Descartes is the guy we, we perhaps unfairly attribute this view of a closed domain of mind to. Um, but in the Cartesian tradition, we have built powerful stories that lead to powerful engineering results, but that rely on the notion that an awful lot is in the head that probably isn't in the head. And the problem is vividly illustrated in this diagram, which shows a head which captures perceptual input, which is represented and sent upstairs for being analyzed for the purposes of cognition. Unfortunately, this head is populated by lots of little people. There's not a little homunculi in there. And that is not what's going on. If you represent something, a representation is a representation only for someone. So it's not enough to build a model of the world in the head. Someone would have to interpret the model. You can see where this is going. The very notion of representing the world and your cognition being internal leads to some peculiar puzzles. One of the best places this has been made perfectly explicit is in the film Being John Malkovich. In the film Being John Malkovich, 
a, a, a silly idea is played out, but one that has a great deal of resonance for this consideration. In being John Malkovich, the idea is put forward that the, there's an actor, John Malkovich, and you can actually access the inside of his head through a tunnel. Here's the tunnel opening. You go into the tunnel and you find yourself literally in his head, looking out through his eyes. And this leads to all kinds of bizarre effects. And in the conceit of the film, you get about 15 minutes in there and then you suddenly find yourself dropped down on the side of a New Jersey turnpike. It's a crazy idea, but it's a crazy idea that gets its appeal precisely because we often think about ourselves in this crazy way. There's a tiny door in my office, Maxine, and it takes you inside John Malkovich. There's no such thing as a hole into somebody's brain. Yes, there is. You see the world through John Malkovich's eyes? Yes! And then after about 15 minutes... That's not me. I didn't say that. You're spit out into a ditch on the side of the New Jersey turnpike. It was amazing. Where the hell are we? We're about subconscious. Do you think that it's kind of weird that John Malkovich has a portal? I mean, do you think that it might have some sort of significance? What is going on? Huh? I discovered that portal. It's my head! John Cusack, Cameron Diaz, Catherine Keener, and John Malkovich. Malkovich! Malkovich! <laughs> Being John Malkovich. It's an excellent film and it illustrates the problem of being undisciplined in our use of concepts. You notice that they spoke of being inside his head, of accessing his subconscious. They mixed up the words mind and brain. And it, the whole thing is a, an astounding and wonderful farce. So some approaches to thinking about knowledge representation lead to this kind of logical problem. If representations have to be interpreted by it, by somebody, we end up with this infinite regress. In being John Malkovich, there are literally other people inside his head, so that what he sees is input to their minds, and so on. And you can see we're going to have heads inside heads inside heads inside heads. Now, the computational theory of mind encourages this kind of fantasy about our minds and brains. Robotics took off big time in the 1970s as well. And it was informed by the prevailing computational theory of mind. And it was assumed by many roboticists that in order to build robots, another great dream like artificial intelligence, um, more dream than substance at that stage, in order to build robots, they would have to be human-like and they would have to have internal representations of the world and be very clever computers. And some of the first lessons that were learned from robotics uh, were the exact opposite. Rodney Brooks is one robotics researcher at MIT who spoke quite eloquently of the insights that early robotics work gained. He says, when I started building walking robots, I built six-legged robots, and rather than have them compute ahead of time a stable way of walking, I made the legs very sensitive to things that they touched in the environment and made it so it was safe for them to fall down and had it learned to scramble over rough terrain, feeling its way as it went, instead of sitting back and looking at the whole terrain in front and computing the optimal path through. My robots got down and dirty with the environment and interacted with the environment at every step. So his robots didn't find the need to build a complicated map of or model or representation of their environment. Rather, they needed bodies that were suited to their environment and they needed to interact sensitively and continuously with the environment. Famously, Rodney Brooks said, this kind of representational thinking is holding us back. You don't need a world model in the head in order to deal with the world. The world itself is its own best representation. So there's been tons of debate along these lines in cognitive science. And in, 20, in wherever we are now, 2023, um, there we, we can survey the principal approaches and we see a fundamental divide between representational approaches which are couched in terms of the computational theory of mind, 
and a whole heap of embodied, embedded, ecological, enacted varieties, all of which center the body and not the brain as a distinguished center of, the, of intelligence. Representationalism speaks of the building of inner models of an external world. Embodied approaches look rather at the relation between bodies and worlds. And these are all developing at the same time. Um, but it's quite clear that the popular imagination uh, gets far more science fiction stuff based on false metaphors than it is appropriate, really. Um, one old philosophical problem that was raised with identifying minds and brains and building representational stories is the old brain in a vat argument. This was introduced by the philosopher uh, Hilary Putnam, who suggested that, well, if you think that your mind is your brain and it's the contents of the mind arise from the senses feeding information in and the action of the body is output, if you think of your brain like that, then maybe you could be deluded. Someone could be providing inputs. Um, if you think computationally, a giant computer could be providing inputs to your brain to make you, to mislead you. And of course, your outputs, which change the world, will have to be monitored so that your internal world model is updated. It's a crazy scenario. It's very difficult to even think of. But Handley, the filmmakers who made the Wachowski sisters, who made the uh, Matrix trilogy, gave us a very good representation of part of the puzzle. If you haven't seen The Matrix, it's a trilogy uh, of movies, and it's only the first one, really, that's worth watching from a philosophical point of view. The rest is just more movies. But in the first, the premise of the first one, spoiler alert, is that it's a dystopian future in which machines rule the world and humans are now farmed for a, an ill-specified form of bioenergy. And this requires that human bodies be grown in pods, but they have to just be kept still and just to generate this magic bioenergy. And so they have a, a computer connection at the back of the, the base of the brain jacking them into a big computer, leading them to believe that they're walking around in 1999 and that they are fully embodied uh, humans living their best life. And removal of the computer connection reveals the horrible truth. You've seen it. This is very close to the idea of the brain in a vat idea. And... When I present this, people often go, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a cool idea, isn't it, that everything could be a simulation. Uh, that's not the point here. Um, it's not just to say, what if it's all a simulation? You have to see, if to make sense of this, you have to see what are the assumptions, the unlikely, implausible assumptions you made to make it seem like it might be plausible that everything is a simulation. In, these, in the brain in a vat and in the matrix, the brain is treated as the sole locus of the mind and it's treated as an input-output device. None of this is true. None of this is true at all. But that's necessary to get this story going. It's assumed that conscious experience arises based on inputs. It's assumed that electrical signals going into the brain generate experience. And it assumes that movement is an output is completely separate from the business of engaging with recognizing and seeing the world. Those are a whole set of assumptions that are needed in order to make the story work, that it, it's all a simulation. Um, now, The Matrix is, of course, a movie, and this was a philosophical problem, but there are contemporary approaches, very influential contemporary approaches in neuroscience that come perilously close to this. They fall under the label of neuroconstructivism. And you may find claims out there that your experience of the world is nothing but a controlled hallucination, for example. You should regard such stories with caution. If they are not carefully and humbly considered and thought through, it can lead to an entirely pessimistic view of yourself, a nihilistic kind of view. What's important is that these stories are presented with all the authority of contemporary neuroscience, with its fancy technology and its uh, 
glowing blue brains. It is not on secure ground, not on secure ground epistemologically, in terms of describing experience, not on secure ground ontologically, in terms of describing the world and its contents. There are profound questions lurking here that are not answered by scientists, but scientists have a habit of moving in and claiming that they can answer. In this course, you're made aware of the way in which scientific questions sit on top of much deeper questions, which don't admit of simple answers. So the last 50, 60 years of work in the area of building representational models, uh, building robots, and developing artificial intelligence and all its variants, have led to something of a paradoxical situation. It's even got a name. It's called Moravec's Paradox. The kind of assumptions that researchers worked with after the Second World War was that the human faculty of reason or intelligence or rational thought, so beloved of Descartes, that that would be, require huge amounts of computation and that this was how we were going to build minds. But what was found instead was that problems that can be expressed in that form, like chess, actually can be solved relatively easily computationally and we can do them very easily now. But the stuff that we hadn't thought of, the sensory motor skills, the ability to walk, the ability to feel your way around, that which we share with the animals, in other words, evades our computational capacities completely. So that the computational theory of mind belongs squarely in the bunch of theorizing about humans that sets them apart from the animals. And we have so much to learn um, about our commonalities with animals and perhaps even plants. Here's a time-lapse picture of a sweet pea which is growing. And when you look at this, you're seeing something that could be described accurately as perceptually guided exploratory action, searching around for a support in the environment that requires, that this plant requires a support in order to grow further. You could describe this entirely in terms of higher cognition. This is a pea plant. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't have a nervous system. So the manner in which we describe some things um, will determine what concepts we bring to bear on it. The human story of intelligence needs to be understood in its context uh, and its complicated relation to both science, technology and the politics of power.